Uh, we are in John chapter 3 this morning, and as we kind of work ourselves through John, I'm finding myself, I'm finding it harder and harder to encapsulate, no, that's my word, get the whole chapter in these words in 30 minutes. Um, I'm having a harder time doing that. So we're going to probably begin to just um, poke our way through some of this stuff. Like today, what's in John 3? Thank you, John 3.16. Everybody knows John 16. Well, I assume everybody knows John 3.16, or at least knows of that there's a John 3.16. If you watch football, it's at least on a sign somewhere in the football stadium that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now, that is a phenomenal verse. And in 16 and 17, it basically tells you everything that the New Testament is wanting to tell you in those two verses. I mean, it really just paraphrases the good, the good news in the gospel. We're going to look at some different things. And so we look, we see now Christ is becoming the divine teacher. And really this section here tells us it's a matter of life and death. And we're going to see Jesus in three different roles, the teacher, the bridegroom, and the witness. And so we're going to start, there are Bibles in your pews if you need one. There are apps on your phone if you need one. But I, you're going to want to follow along somehow. Or if you're just an auditory learner, I will speak words. Chapter 3, verse 1, there was a man named Nicodemus. A Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. Let's stop right there. Uh, so he knew the Old Testament. He knew the laws. He knew the rules. This is what he's been studying for several years. He knows all about this. He's a smart man. He's a, he's a dignified man. He, he's the uppity ups. But he's a religious leader. So after a dark one evening, let's stop right there. Why go to Jesus in the dark? There's a couple thoughts there. One, he did not want the other Pharisees to know he's speaking to Jesus. Because right now, the Pharisees are like, who is this man causing us trouble? He is not going by our laws. And he says he's the Messiah. He says he's the Christ. Who is he? But maybe he just wanted to have a conversation with Jesus. And sometimes the best conversations are at night, after we've processed the day. Sometimes they're in the morning before we leave for the day. Sometimes they're in the car while you're being pulled over. But after dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say, You'd be, uh, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants. The wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. How are these things possible, Nicodemus asked. You are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. Let's stop there. There's going to be people in our life, there are people in our lives that we've been around Jesus for a long time, we just don't get it. And a lot of times we just want to say, you know what, you're not going to get it, so I'm done with you. I just want to leave you here because you're not getting it. Stop. This is a religious leader that knew and understood what the Messiah was to do and, and, and the Christ to come. He understood it, he knew that. Yet... He's not understanding. Listen, there's a lot to understand about God. There's a lot to understand about Jesus. There's a lot to understand about the Holy Spirit. In one conversation or two conversations, you're not... Do we, do we know everything we need to know? No. 
Are you still learning? I hope so. I, I hope so. I hope you're still learning. I hope this isn't your meat. I hope this is just part of it. We do see later, we don't know what happens with Nicodemus here. We don't, we don't know. We don't, did it happen right away? I think over the next two years, as he continued to see Jesus work and hear the stories of Jesus, he made a decision to follow Jesus. Not law, but to follow Jesus. Because later, after Jesus' death, we'd see Nicodemus come again. <laughs> So Jesus says, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things? I don't know if he's like, jeez, I'm wasting my time here. But he says, I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. It's like when we, when we, when we see great things happen, we're like, oh, it just must have been by chance. So I took a, a thing of gasoline and some oil and uh, some lettuce, and I, I shook it up really good, and I got a garden. Um, things like that just don't happen. Things are, are divine and set on its course. No one um, has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven, verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. We're going to come back to that. That's heavy. So that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Now, everybody knows this. For God... So, for this is how God of the world, he gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And so often we want to stop there, but 17 is just as good. Because it says this, God sent his son into the world, what? Not to judge. Not to condemn, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes it believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. And all do all who do evil hate the light, refuse to go near it, for their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that what they are doing, God wants. We're going to come back to this. This is good and rich. Four things I want to point out here. First of all, Nicodemus uh, was, was saying, uh, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus and said, hey, um, he, he brings up birth. Okay, he brings up birth. And, and, he, and he talks about this water. You can't be born again unless you have the water. Okay? So, um, really depends on what commentary you want to read. This is like a heavily, like in, in theological thoughts, um, and really smart people with um, plaques on their wall and stuff. Um, I have them too. I just signed them myself. <laughs> These actually have colleges on them. Um, this is a heavily debated, like, what does water mean? What is it? So there are three uh, options. One is the amniotic fluid. However, there's nothing uh, in Jewish tradition or Jewish literature that would associate the word uh, amniotic fluid with water. No. So that one's kind of out. There's a possibility of, well, it meant purification. And, and the Old Testament was, was filled with associations with the Holy Spirit and the wind and water, especially in terms of bringing people back to life. And so that, that's, an obvi that's, an, that's a possibility. The one that makes the most sense is baptism for me. The one that makes the most sense of, of being born into water is baptism. And here's why. Uh, this gets really technical, and I didn't know this until I looked it up and started studying this week. So... Some of you guys are like, why are we talking about nouns? <laughs> Is this English? Uh, so well, I'm done with school. So both are nouns. Water and spirit are nouns. And they are governed by a single preposition, which means uh, they're referring to one birth, not two births. So you don't have the birth of the, of the, of the water, you don't have the birth of the spirit. It's, it's specifically talking about there's one birth. Uh, secondly, um, you guys, if you guys want to look this up, you'll have to write it down. Uh, water and spirit is linked to Ezekiel 36. And Ezekiel is a prophet, um, 36, 25 through 27. Uh, we also see that baptism, obviously, has already been introduced by John, John the Baptist. And we're going to get to him in just a little bit, because he, uh, like, I, like I, I continue to say, John 3 is overshadowed by John 3.16. I mean, that's, that's a key verse. It's great. But there's, there's, there's some stuff that John says at the end here. 
that is so powerful, so great. Uh, and so baptism has already been introduced by John, so it's probably the first thing that's popping into people's heads when, when John's readers, and even Nicodemus, is reading this. Or hearing this and reading this. A water and spirit are connected in other passages, for instance, Acts 19, 1 through 7. Uh, when you look back at the Greek and the Latin fathers, uh, they interpret this verse as immersion, baptism. Uh, just in a few moments, we're going to read a part where we see Jesus baptizing. And then uh, a seventh reason is John's original readers could hardly have read this combination and not thought of baptism. John's baptism will give, give way to Jesus' baptism, which will give way to Christian baptism, which is what we uh, have now as immersion. And so to be born again, let's, let's make this simple, okay? I just really, everybody's like, I just hit a deer, That's a lot of information, okay? New life comes through work, comes through baptism. New life into God. New life into this, you know, the spiritual life comes through baptism immersion. Okay, that's the best way we can sum all the way, sum all that up. I know some of you guys are wanting, wanting to, to bigger with me. So do you have to be baptized to be saved? If the Bible exclaims it and screams it, it's a good idea to make sure that we've done that. Okay? It's, it's a, a good idea to just to make sure we have all the bases covered. So then he goes, starts talking about the wind. Uh, verse 8. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from. And so uh, this wind kind of goes back to uh, Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. And many of you may remember this. Uh, Ezekiel was a prophet. He was in the valley of dead bones. And he prosif- prof- <laughs> prophesied to the wind. And the Spirit came and gave those bones new life. Lauren Daigle's, uh, when I first thought, I thought she was going to be, uh, just the way she sounds, okay, I thought she was in some uh, southern gospel choir, you know, because Lauren Daigle just has this booming voice, and when you see her, she's like a, she's a stick figure. <laughs> like, where do you get all that? Where does that come from? She talks to, sings a song now about dry bones coming to life, and that's a prophecy done by Ezekiel back in the Old Testament. We see next that, that Jesus talks to Nicodemus about a serpent on the pole. And you might be asking yourselves, why is Jesus referring? Because this is what Nicodemus knows and understands. He, this, is, this is stuff he teaches and he preaches. This is stuff that he studied. He knows, all, he knows what Moses did. He, did. he knows what Ezekiel has prophesied. Because that's what he knows. It's what he studies. It's what he teaches. <laughs> And so in Numbers chapter 21, there's a story of sin. And the nation of Israel rebelled. And God sent, God sent fiery serpents. You mean the loving God? <laughs> Many people died that were bitten by those serpents. But it's also a story of grace because God told Moses to build a, a brass serpent. And he would lift it up on a pole for all to see. And when people looked by faith, they were saved from the serpents. I want us to look at that word lifted up. Because when we look at that here, so the Son of Man, just like like Moses lifted up that, the Son of Man must be lifted up. And here's what the lifted up means. To be crucified and to be glorified and exalted to be crucified and to be glorified and exalted. And so when we think of the cross, this was not the end of Jesus' glory. It was the means of Jesus' glory. It was the doing, not the end result. It was, it had to be done. It was the means, it was the, the action. And then he goes into light and darkness and we see a, light and dark, a lot of light and dark here in, in John. And Jesus is, is really good in the extreme, but he's not very tame. <laughs> okay? 
And so he's, he's demanding, he is painfully incisive, he's vindictive, vindictive of sin and intolerant of unbelief. He is light, he is light that ruthlessly exposes our wickedness. Did you, did you hear me earlier when I said this? And the uh, blah, blah, blah. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for their sins will be exposed. Why do we hate going to church? Because then we have to look into our lives. I'm not saying you, because you're here. But for most people, they don't want to come into a relationship because they have to clean up their act. They don't want to come into the church because they're, they, I think in the back of their minds, because we have this, we were created by God, and so there's only a place in our life that God can fill that we don't want to fill that with God because we don't want to expose some of the hateful things we've said or the demeaning things we've thought. We don't want to get rid of some of this stuff that brings us joy. <clears throat> let, me, let me rephrase that. We don't want to get rid of some of this stuff that brings us happiness. I'm sorry I used joy there. That's totally not the right word. Because happiness and joy are two very different things. I think that the closer we get to Jesus, the more our lives have to be exposed. Does anybody want to go see God? <laughs> with any darkness available? I don't. I don't. So the closer we get to God, the more that has to be revealed. And our hearts are going to be revealed. They're revealed to Him now. He knows what's on our hearts. He knows what's on our minds. He knows the, the, the terrible things I, 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 I've said and the terrible things I've thought. And, and you know that's why Jesus said, hey, you don't have to actually murder somebody. You can get it in your head and it becomes, you know, it's like, it's like really doing it. So we see Jesus as the teacher, and I hope that you've learned something through that story of Nicodemus, because now we enter a time where, where uh, verse 22, then Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem and went to the Judean countryside. Jesus, listen to this, Jesus spent some time there, baptizing people. That's awesome. Because a lot of times we think of, of, of John doing it, and, or, or, or the, we see the apostles doing it, and you know, we, now we see ministers. Can I tell you something? I'm happiest when I don't have to be the, the one baptizing. That means somebody else played a role in that person's life. That means somebody else led them to Jesus. Somebody else told them the good news. I'm happy to do it, don't get me wrong. Very happy to do it. And I usually let the people being baptized suggest who they want to have that happen. So Jesus spent some time there baptizing people. And at this time, John the Baptist was baptizing in Anan near Salim because there was plenty of water there and people kept coming to him for baptism. Okay, so John had to put in parentheses this was done before John was put in the prison just so we know that John the Baptist is still out here, and then about nine months later, from right now in the story, he gets put into prison. A debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew over ceremonial, ceremonial cleansing. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, man, uh, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people, and everybody's going to him instead of coming to us. <sighs> Do something, John. Do something. Don't we get into some ridiculous thoughts? And I'm probably the, the worst at it. Why would you want to go to that church? We have it all here. We don't even charge for coffee. No, I'm, I'm a big culprit in that. I, I, I get, I, it gets me frustrated a lot. But, but, uh, then John replies with this, no one can receive anything unless God gives it to him from heaven. You know yourselves, you yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom. So this is where we see the bridegroom. Jesus as the bridegroom who marries the bride and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. And that's a great thought. Even now, 
many of us still remember that day that, that we were married, or we, not married, but we were the best man, or we were in the, we were in the, we were a groomsman, and just being able to represent that, that friend, that's, that's key, and John's like, I just want to be the groomsman, <laughs> I just want to listen to the vows, and then he says this, it is sim, I, uh, Therefore, and filled with joy at his success, he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. Big G, little I. Big G, big God, little I. I want you to say that a couple times in your head. God must become greater, I must become less. God must become greater, I must become less. There was a time... Uh, that I wanted to, um, to to lead this mega church, and uh, I always thought that was my destiny. But you know what? Um, that was me becoming greater, <laughs> not less. That was me becoming greater in my own mind, in my own heart, and not less. You can become greater because he is greater. I'm not talking about you guys can become, um, like the main thing that he is talking about here is the focus. Where's the focus? Like John's disciples like, they should become to you because your name, it's even in your name, John. You're John the baptizer. He's Jesus the Messiah. But they're still going to him. See, John could have easily said, you know what? You are my disciples. You are my followers. And we're going to take it. We're going to go, we're going to go challenge him to a baptism. I don't know what they would have done, but, but that's not where his heart was at all. At all. His heart was always focused on his small mission and the greater cause and purpose. And you guys might not think that what you guys do in life is a big mission. You may not think that what you do here at the church is a very big mission. I can still remember the few people that I had relationships with when I was a Schwanzman. I still think about it. And the relationships you were building because where God put you. Because where God called you to. And you guys might not think that's a very big, big, cool place, but it's where God has you. So enjoy that. Big G, little I, he must become greater. I must become less. Then we have some of the last recorded words of John the Baptist. He says, He, Jesus, has come from above and is greater than anyone else. We are of the earth and we speak of earthly things, but he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. He testifies about what he has seen and heard. Who has he seen and heard? He's been with God. He has seen God. He has heard God. And now he's explaining this to his people, to the people that will listen. Anyone who accepts his testimony can affirm that God is true. For he is sent by God, he speaks God's words, for God gives him the spirit without limit. The father loves his son and has put everything into his hands, and anyone who believes in God's son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. We see right there that he came from heaven. The verse 31, it says, Jesus came from heaven. And so Jesus is really becoming the witness and the authority and the spokesman of God. He came from heaven. In verse 32 and 33, it comes from him firsthand. Who's giving him this information firsthand? God. So this was a really big deal for John's readers and even John's, John the Baptist's uh, followers and disciples to understand, I'm nothing. I'm, I'm simply a tool in, God, in God's 
huge mission. But what an important role he played. He goes on to say that, that in 34 and 35 that God had authorized Jesus to do these things. In verse 36, we can escape the wrath of God. And how do we do that? Well, it goes back to the very first conversation we just talked about with Nicodemus. Being born again. And I fully believe the Bible, the New Testament, continually illustrates that entering into the new life with Jesus is through baptism and immersion. It's also by faith. It's also by confession. Confessing our sins and confession as, as we say, yes, I am, I am Jesus. I, I surrender. I am Jesus's. Confessing. It's also through repentance as I did Two hours ago. <laughs> Three hours ago. I had my kids with me this morning. As I can hear, they came to set up. And I was I was passing the police officer. I started slowing down and pulling up. <laughs> like, what? I'm like, oh, I just got pulled over. He didn't even turn on his lights. <laughs> And I, I, I couldn't I couldn't look at my kids. I haven't seen my wife yet, so that's but she knows. Left that for her to step on as she walked out the door. We have two sick kids this morning, so she's not with us this morning. But uh, man, I, you know, you, you think of just a small little thing like a speaking to I was still disobeying the law, which is disobeying God. And then I think of, uh, as a youth minister and, and uh, having a group of about eight, and we built that into a group of about 70 in about four years. And um, through all of that, I was entangled in, 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 in pornography. I mean, I, all of that time, all of that time, just to say that God was still working. <laughs> Through me and through the people with us, that God was still working. In fact, 13 of those uh, kids became ministers or children's pastors or youth pastors. Uh, uh, even a higher percentage continued to, uh, to, to surrender their lives fully to God daily, still an active in a church. And so I think, you know, I, I would be thinking this, so maybe you are too, that why would God work his plans and his mission through people like us? It's because his love and his mercy and his grace are bigger than what we understand. And he's going to continue to work through your mistakes. So I look over at my daughter, I'm like, honey, I'm so sorry. Isaac, he's like, whatever. And she's like, oh, it's Okay. Like, oh, so you, you don't know your mom very well. It's, it's not okay. Okay? It's not. And uh, maybe I will just start letting her drive. Because, because for a long time, I mean, just all, even up to now, it's been, uh, Derek, you might want to slow down a little bit. Derek, you know, this is a 35, and you're going like 45. Um, I, I always I always blame it on the weight of my shoes, um, right? Our shoes are bigger and they're way more. Yeah, it's a, it's a tall person problem. Um, that that you know even through the smallest and the worst and the biggest <laughs> calamities of our own lives, God is still at work. Because he has purpose and mission for you. <laughs> and the sooner we can surrender, the greater the opportunity to bring him glory. And that's really all we want to do, isn't it? Isn't it all we want to do is bring him joy and honor and praise and the glory he deserves? Because if that's our ultimate goal, then we need to become less and he needs to become more. He needs to become greater. 
we might need to become less. That's the sermon today. I must become less. He must become greater. There's other things that we can get out of this. Well, even John 3, 16 is in there. For God so loved the world. Yeah, yeah, he does. That he sent Jesus, who is his only son, down to earth because he left per- perfection for mess, for a garbage dump of a, a circle. And people that are going to uh, walk away from him to die on the cross as a perfect lamb. So that we don't have to experience, we don't have to experience eternity. Now, this is not a hellfire and damnation brimstone. This is not this, but this is true. Eternal life or eternal life. I mean, it's heaven or hell. This is that's the choice, and that's the choice we have to pick up our cross every day and make that choice. Not between heaven and hell. That's a, we get to choose that. By accepting Jesus as our personal and Savior, but we do have to pick up our cross daily and surrender our will to it. And that's the hardest thing I do every day. Because I know some of the things that I'm not enjoying would take away from my family. Would take away from the people I need to be around. Father, thank you that the cross ran. When we think of love, we think of the heart, we think of, I mean, the very first color that pops in my head is red. And, and why is that, God? It's because we've always colored hearts red? Or is it simply because of what, <laughs> what the cross looks like? Love. Blood stained wood. Two big beams. The symbol that we wear around our neck. Because we are thankful for death. But excited about life. So God, help us to live life to the fullest. As you become creator and we can become blessed in our own lives. Your name is Chris.